Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to a special edition of the HP Leader podcast. And the purpose of this podcast is to start the conversation around race, ethnicity and culture. And that is so important in this current climate. Now, we're talking about how we can change the culture of conversations and how we can change them at every stage of our career and why that's important. And I can't do that alone. So I'm delighted to introduce a panel to you. And I'm so grateful on this Sunday, Sunday evening now that they're giving their time up for free in a very busy world um, to speak and help us today. So Larry, can I start with you? Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi Rachel, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Larry Koyama. I'm a physiotherapist by profession. My current role is as head of um, program for the first contact practitioner role at the Charter Society of Physiotherapy. Fabulous, thank you. Mariam? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a paediatric speech and language therapist, uh, primarily working with the under fives. Um, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> and you've got some, I've, I've, I've read some of your work as well. So you've, you've got some amazing insight and I'm really looking forward to, to, to chatting to you, Mariam. I do enjoy doing a bit of blogging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll signpost people to that, um, for sure. Jackie? Um, I'm Jackie Walumbe and I am also a physiotherapist. Um, I am currently in a clinical academic role where I do research and I work on my PhD most of the time and I see patients on one day a week. Um, what else? Yeah, in chronic pain, that's, what I, that's important, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I focus on people with long-term or chronic pain um, within a hospital setting. Thank you. And Arnie? Hi, so yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, so my name is Arnie Puntis, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, I work in with older people, inpatient rehab and out in the community and some day hospitals as well. Thank you. So many of you will probably be thinking and wondering why I, as a British white physiotherapist, are sat here leading a podcast on race, equality, inclusion, and culture well there lies the point exactly so there never has been a more important time in such visible scenes of racial injustice that we should be having the conversations especially within our professions and especially in the workplace it's important because we have a community that are hurting right now and it's important we understand why they're hurting and I, for the listeners of this podcast, being for the new leaders of our profession, um, I, you know, I've got a few years on you, I'm not going to lie. And I first started my leadership journey properly, like when I properly started to think about leadership about 10 years ago. And I learned as part of that journey that I didn't really understand my white privilege. And for those of you that don't know what that means, that's about the inherent, inherent advantages that I've been given because of my white skin colour. And in parcel with that comes um, understanding my white culture. And I didn't even know that existed. You know, I was brought up in a very traditional white family in a very traditional white working class northeast um, community that lacked diversity. And I just thought it was UK culture and therefore I didn't need to learn, but I did. And when I started my management career, I realized that I had to understand cultural differences because I was going to be managing people with diverse cultures. And if I didn't understand my own, then how on earth could I understand anyone else's? So that's one of the first things I wanted to get across to people who are listening today is, do you really understand that? Do you understand the privileges that have been afforded to you because of the color of your skin and how that might create barriers for people that don't look like you and have the same identity. Now, we're not gonna to get too heavy on this podcast and we did have a discussion as a panel member about that. We don't wanna scare people away because what we wanna do is include people in the conversations that need to happen. And I certainly promised myself in any leadership position that I had, that I would use my platform and my voice to help encourage inclusion and equity 
in any place I worked and in any platform. So this is why we're having the conversation now. It's a conversation starter. And when I've done some research into this, I didn't just go into this willy nilly and I didn't just go into this thinking I'd have an idea and would, would get a group of people. There is a lot of anxiety about these conversations because some of them are challenging and some of them will open up feelings and emotions that people have that are incredibly real and incredibly real now. So what's the point in all of this? The point is that when I've asked people, junior members of staff, um, staff across all um, grades of qualification and years of qualification, are they comfortable having the conversations? Have they been reaching out? People haven't been. These conversations aren't happening. So today we're going to talk to a panel of people on how we can start the conversations and why they should be meaningful and why it's important and how we now in this moment of time in all of our lives, we can change the culture of conversations. So we're all going to, we've been qualified a little while, but we're going to put ourselves in that staff room, in that team as being the newly qualified member. And what it feels like to be part of a community that are hurting right now. So I want to start by asking anyone from the panel to start the conversation about how we reach out, how you reach out to that, uh, your black colleague, your Asian colleague, anyone from an ethnic minority, how do you reach out? How do you do it? We're all quiet. Larry, are you going to go first? I'll go first. I think it's really difficult to give advice and, and I don't think one rule for one person applies to everyone. Um, what I will say is that in the experience that I've had, I think it's been really powerful when people have just asked if you're okay or people have just said, conscious of what's going on at the moment, how is it impacting you? Um, and that that enables a conversation to be had. Uh, we touched on this before, so there are different types of different levels of conversation, but I think simply showing concern and recognizing is a significant step. I think the worst thing that can be done is to pretend that something's not happening or to ignore the issue because that just cements what people already experience and think, um, particularly about being invisible or not being recognized. So I think there are there are many methodologies, there are many things you can you can think about, you can, but I think simply acknowledging and asking and recognizing that there is a topic to be discussed is a good place to start. Absolutely. So it's that it's that how are you question and it's actually being meaningful. And I think I think if anyone else wants to comment on this, the the reason why, and this is what people have told me, so this isn't me just making things up, this is people have told me, when I said, why don't you ask the question, how are you? If someone had a bereavement, if someone had a sick child, if someone had something, if they'd lost their mobile phone, you, you would ask them how, you are, how they are. Why is that such a difficult thing to do in this situation? And the majority of people say it's because they're scared of saying the wrong thing. They're fearful of it being purely down to race, and they're worried that that might that, that might be an indirect form of you know um, um, identifying someone because of their race but that's exactly what we need to do does anyone have a comment on that oh i was just going to say i think it is really valuable to respect um the context of your relationship with your colleagues so depending on who you are in the team and, and where you sit your responsibility and, and and the nature of that relationship will look and feel different and I think there, there, you know, it's. I think it's good that people are being uh, considerate and careful around having these conversations, um, because there is a degree of of of, of um, you know caution that is necessary. Because I think if we're talking about people's um, emotional experiences here, people that there can be trauma attached to these experiences and these 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 events. And so I think there is a degree of of kind of um, um, why don't you come struggling for the right word here but kind of an emotional intelligence that's really required so i think for something you know for example if someone's your supervisor um you know they absolutely should have the skills to be able to approach you and say are you okay um and 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 have the, have the skills to check in in a way that's going to be meaningful for example absolutely jackie can i come to you 
Yeah, I, I think that was just really lovely what, um, what Mariam just said, because there's something about um, the care. So if somebody asks me how I am, just that sentence is enough to make me feel seen and somebody's thought about me in the context of how the world sees me. So it's, it's just something very simple, but I think it can also be very powerful emotionally. Mm -hmm. particularly given the the current um you know events on television and things like that you know it's so lovely to have someone just say i see you i see that there's a connection between you the person here and what's happening on my tv mm -hmm. and making that connection is, is is i think that can be enough as a starting point i suppose and that is so I think even that Jackie and Mariam is so powerful for people to hear because they are fearful of just asking the question are you okay and then be there being a negative response back um I think that we can as reassure people as much as we can that is not going to happen if it's in a genuine may, way with care like you said Mariam and compassion you genuinely care if your colleague and your peer your peer, your professional peer, you know, on the same level that like you said, res respect, you kind of, because it's not about hierarchy, it's just about, is it, like you said, is it your place? And with your peers, it is. Reach out and just ask that question. Arnie, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry, I was just going to say that, um, it's to echo those thoughts that it has to be genuine, but also there's probably a step before that you've actually got a good relationship with these, with your colleagues anyway. So mm. this isn't the first time you're asking them how they are. It might be the first time you're asking them how they are within this context, but actually I think it's important that regardless of this, that you're able to have, you know, open conversations and build relationships and build trust mm. so that when you are approached or when you approach someone else, that they know that you're genuine and they know that there's that safe environment and they're not, the person isn't asking because they, they've been told to do it, but they're doing it because they genuinely care. I think that's really important. I'll just add to that. I think, I think that's really crucial. I think there's something about that authenticity that that's really important in those, in those conversations. Um, I think there's also, there's also something about being vulnerable, which is okay. And, and that will differ a little bit based on the kind of the experience that you have, um, the level that you're working at. So a really good example was my boss, basically, just because we're working remotely at the moment, sent me an email saying, look, I should have addressed this earlier. I didn't, but I want you to know that it's still on my radar. Can we have a conversation about it when you're ready? And to me, that was a really powerful email. It was clearly very honest and very, very open, um, but also showed her vulnerability and saying, actually, it was quite sensitive. I didn't quite get it right the first time, but actually I do recognize that's a conversation that needs to be had. So I think no one's expecting anyone to be perfect in these situations. Um, you know, we're talking about race at the moment, but there will be lot other areas of discrimination and inequality where those conversations need to be had, um, which, is just, which is just as important. So, so I, think, I think trust, um, being honest, being genuine, but also being um, having being able to have that vulnerability of saying, actually, I don't quite know how to have this conversation, but it's something that I think is important. Um, how best should we go ahead? Do you want to, when you're ready, should we have a conversation? Do you want to do it in a group, one to one, and giving the people a choice? They might say, actually, it's not the right time for me to talk about it, but thank you. Um, I'll let you know when I am, or actually, yeah, can we have a one to one to discuss things? absolutely so I think to put things slightly in context because I'm aware I never assume things anymore at this this stage in my career um the reason why we're having this podcast now and why we need to change the culture of conversations now is in relation to many many things but in particular um we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and there was a Public Health England report that evidenced the disparity of death between um, the difference between white and those from ethnic um, minorities, so from BAME populations. So we have a direct correlation and that makes people anxious. We don't know the correlation and we don't know the reason why. So there's a massive area of uncertainty for us as managers and how we manage that. And your BAME peers will not just be 
you know, fearful or anxious for themselves, but their family members. And they might have actually experienced death as a result of the COVID pandemic. Then there is obviously the tragic murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters protest marches, which are very visible, which are everywhere you look in society. They're in the radio, on the news, in the papers, and people are talking about it in offices. And it's about the context in which you have these conversations. And I want you to think about how mindful you're being if you're having these conversations, which everyone should have. Everyone's entitled to talk about news agendas. But it's maybe just thinking a little bit from listening to this about the impact that might have on people. Because the reason why the BAME community are hurting, and again, I don't want to sit here as, the white, as a white person and speak on the behalf of a community I'm not part of, but what people tell me is that this is bringing up experiences from their past, whether it be racial trauma and disc discrimination, um, inequality, or things that might have happened to them in their life. So it's a very powerful and emotive subject. And I think the way that everyone's just articulated so, so lovingly there is about how we ask, how are you and why it means something. Now, one of the, one of the kind of barriers to someone asking the question is then what do you do with the information you're given? So as a newly qualified member of staff or a new leader, um, you know, if someone discloses something to you, what do you do with that information? So where would you go to? So obviously we can signpost to your seniors or your managers, but it's in having that com moment, conversation in that moment in time and someone confiding in you and they might not want you to tell anyone else, how can we, how can we deal with that? How can we, how can we make sure we listen and, and act responsibly? Mariam? Yeah, and um, I think it's about being an ally, really, is if, if, a, if, a, if a, you know, a, a peer at work feels comfortable enough to approach you with something that's concerning them, I think firstly that that should be seen as a real kind of privilege and honour, um, and it's about respecting the fact that they have done that, um, and I think it's about building those relationships at work, whether you have other allies who are actually, you know, you can go to and trust if you don't feel that you have the skills that, you know, required to support um, with, with, with any given issue. It could be race or it could be something else. Um, and then I think it's about supporting that person to access the right support. And that, you know, that could look differently for, for, for each individual, depending on their situation and circumstances, be it going to a, approaching a manager anonymously you know, I think it's about working with that individual who's approached you for support and allowing them to tell you what's going to work for them. But I think really respecting and honouring that they've come to you with that information um, is probably a really good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's not as the new leader, as the newly qualified or as the band five, as the junior, however we're going to define people. Um, it's not their responsibility to... Um, I suppose, carry the ver burden of institutional problems that may exist or will exist in an organisation. They will exist. Um, it is your role as the ally, as the peer, yeah. to be that voice, but may with someone. So they may confide in you because they want to address it, but they feel like they don't want to be known as the angry or the disruptive. Um, you know, and I had, I helped a young... Um, black physiotherapist at one stage in my career and that was exactly the word she used she didn't want to be the angry black woman and she never spoke out for that reason and she was worried about the repercussions it would have um because sorry, she wait, can, I, can i just come back on that yeah sorry so um i'm uh, currently i'm 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 sort of so when i was a band five um i helped run the band five peer support group within my um trust um, and I, I know you, what you're saying perhaps is, you know, you're a manager, so you're, you're looking at it from, from that perspective and thinking about responsibility and where that needs to sit. But I think actually within our own given capacities, wherever we sit within an organisation, we are leaders in our own right. And I think that there is a, a sense of responsibility that we all have to take. And, and unfortunately, we do live in an, in an unjust system. We operate within an unjust system and we work within an unjust system. And so actually, if we're not all willing to take on our burden of, of leadership 
at all of those stages, then actually some of our peers are not going to get the support that they need. So I hear what you're saying, but actually I'd, I'd just like to reinforce that as band fives, band sixes, wherever you sit with that, I think acknowledging the, 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 the leadership that you do hold um, and the responsibility that you hold, given you know, whatever capacity you've got, I think it's really, it's part of the solution. I love that. I love that concept. And that takes guts, doesn't it? I think that takes a bit of bravery. And I'm thinking back to a moment in time in my life, I, I was a band five, we weren't called back band fives back then, we we're called juniors, I think. Um, and I witnessed indirect racism, which I now know is indirect racism. I didn't quite know at the time there. I thought it was just it was just dismissive. I was dismissive of it happening and I didn't call it out and I didn't do anything about it. And I still lose sleep over that actually. Um, but it's about having the confidence to do that, isn't it? And it's use. And I think that's where for me, it boils down. If I understood my white privilege as that band five, I think, I, I think I, ca I can't say for definite that I would have had the confidence to do that. But because I didn't, and I didn't understand my own being, I didn't have the confidence to speak out. And I'm not excusing it because it was wrong. It was wrong not to say something. And it's how we can change that mentality in our junior staff. It's how do we do that? And it, it, we need to go back a step down to universities. We need to be having those conversations in universities and even far back as middle school. I think, you know, in, in school, teaching about culture, teaching about heritage, speak, teaching about diversity, because that, I think, where was my, if I'd have known that as a younger person growing up, that would have changed my whole, how I dealt with things throughout my whole career path. But because I was only learning as the manager, I was already in that management position when I started to learn. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So I think, Mariam, that's so powerful. Be the leader. Be that leader as a student, as a newly qualified member of staff. And if you don't have the confidence to call things like that out, how do you get the confidence? Where do you go? Is this when we start signposting people now to, to things so they can learn? I think I, I totally agree with Mariam. Um, but I also, and, and this might be the challenges of whether the people having these conversations are from particular backgrounds, but I also think there is something about understanding your organizational culture. So, so I've had experiences where I've seen colleagues indirectly, or you know, it's obvious to those that know, are uh, being discriminated against. We've also known that actually calling it out or taking it further wasn't gonna land anywhere. It was, it was completely pointless. So actually in those scenarios, the offer of support was in my treatment room, in my clinic room, during lunch breaks, just offering that moral support um, or signposting them to, to, um, to professional bodies or people who might be able to help in particular, to have particular conversations. So I think there are different levels of allyship. And I, I, I don't know if, if it was Annie that said that, but I think it is important. Um, and and it, does it does matter where, where you are in terms of the, you know, not so much in hierarchy, but in terms of the influence you have within an organisation. Some organisations are very much forward thinking. Um, obviously, that if you have close collaboration and close relationships with your peers, whether that's your band fives or your sixes or, you know, your a team, a strong team is able to have that conversation much more. Um, but I also think there are challenges within hierarchies and within how organisations are structured. And a lot of, a lot of people from, from different backgrounds will tell you, actually, we know this is happening, it's happened for years. We can have the conversations to give ourselves moral support so we can get through it and that's that's one type of support but in terms of having a conversation to actually change it that does require that does require having an organization or setup that is able to think at that level um you know there are scenarios where actually raising it outwardly and, and speaking about it isn't going to get very far but having said that if it was a non-BME person in a senior role having that conversation, like you, said, like you just mentioned, that might, that might then make a difference. And I, I suppose that's the kind of point you're trying to make, which I'd agree with. Jackie, did you want to come in here? Yeah, I, I think um, it's, I think what 
just where the conversation has gone has made me think about, um, you know, like in staff rooms, when we used to have them, um, the, the type of conversations that are happening around you, I think it's important for people to be mindful of, of what they're saying, because that can be a space that, because people consider you um, as a peer and as a colleague, they might forget that, you know, they might not be seeing you in terms of your cultural experiences and your ethnicity. So for example, like you said, Rachel, people might be talking a lot about the protests um, and I think it's important there that people know that yes you can talk about it but you might want to do that with care because a throwaway comment around police brutality or something might be experienced very differently from the other side you know you know ideas you know things about um, yeah I, I think I suppose it's just conversations with care so not just so it's not always about the, the deep and meaningful, how are you? But it's the, when you're talking about other stuff, I think there's an opportunity there to be kinder and to be compassionate in what you're saying. Absolutely. And I think, again, this, Ari, I think this was your point um, at the beginning that it's about understanding culture and it's about where do we go from now? E, the big thing is about reaching out the second thing is about understanding cultural diversity um, and that understanding ethnic identity. And I suppose the question is within your department, um, within yourself, how much do you understand that? And if you were to reach out to your BAME colleagues and want to know who are you, it's not about where someone's from, it's about who they are, how they identify, what their culture is, what's meaningful to them, it's different from ours. That is really powerful and this, that is how I've learned. So we can signpost you to books and to podcasts and to blogs, but actually having that learned lived experience is really important from, from that person's viewpoint. And then once you understand that, being able to identify indirect racial inequality, racial discrimination, um, other rings, uh, you know, I could go on, is, is the only way that that can happen meaningfully rather than someone telling you you've got to do it. Now, I just want to reassure people, and this was a comment that you made, Larry, that people are actually protected by law. So we have the Equality and Diversity Act, I think, in maybe 2010. It's, it's been around a while now, along that while. And what that aimed to do was it put the onus on organizations and employers if there was evidence of racial discrimination within an organization and it's not just about race it's about lots of things and um, it's about inclusion um, of minority groups um, and many other things and it's not again the conversation we're having the audience that we're having it with um, there will be a stop point where you, things need to go through managers and, and seniors but actually the culture within organizations is really important, like you said, Larry. And managers have statistics about these types of things. What managers sometimes do with the statistics is another thing. Um, it's outside of this podcast, but it's about how we use that and how you know, it can protect people who maybe want to raise things that they've seen and have that voice, as you said, Mariam. There is things within an organization and there's boards, there's a quality of diversity boards and there's reps from departments. So you, there's people that you can go and find that can help you if you need support and you feel that there is injustice or inequality within your workplace. Mariam, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's really nice to think about, you know, experiences within the workplace within that wider context of there being laws um, and other other legislation, etc., that is there to protect people. But I think there's also uh, there needs to be an acknowledgement that in order to engage with and access a lot of those avenues, where we kind of have to understand that people's experiences of institutions. Um, mean their faith in, in all of those processes will be of, of kind of a varying degree and I think if you've experienced in institutional racism and institutional discrimination your entire life um, from school upwards probably even before that um, when you were engaging with the health services before you were five you know literally from birth I think that we have to be able to acknowledge that not everybody's going to feel as empowered to engage with those 
um, you know, what should be avenues for everybody to access in terms of support. Um, and so, yeah, where all of those things are really great to have, but actually how much confidence do the people who most need them, do they have in actually exploring accessing them is, would be my kind of question. And I think the consideration that we need to be really actively thinking about within our workplaces. Absolutely agree. I was going to say, I think it's, it's always tricky, isn't it? Because I guess these kind of conversations can go in lots of different directions. But that when you were talking, Rachel, it made me think about just having some of these conversations just come back to just being human and being a decent person and just having a good team. Because actually, if you have a team that's based on having good relationships and good trust, where people care for each other, then these things should happen naturally. I appreciate they're sensitive, but actually if you're, if I was, if I was leading a team where, you know, from the, from the very beginning, our team is, is clear that actually we don't stand for, for discrimination of any sort, that we are open, we're honest, and there's lots of psychological safety and actually we can raise things as a group or individually. I think if you have those kind of cultural foundations of a really strong organization or strong team, then it should enable some of these things to happen when challenges occur in different situations. Of course, that doesn't happen everywhere. And, and there are places where it, then the question is, how do you start those conversations? How do you, how do you create those things? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it just comes back down to being decent human beings who care for each other. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, recognizing that there are obviously huge different levels of, of privilege, of significance, um, of, um, of of bias as well. So, so you know, we've talked about white skin, but you know, but also, even I'm 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 kind of conscious of some of the, I guess I wouldn't call them privilege, but I'm conscious of some of the advantages I have being a male, with a Christian name and having grown up in an, in the English culture and being able to navigate that a bit better compared to, um, so I can think of a few people as we talk, some people who kind of grown up perhaps in India or other countries just as intelligent if not more so but actually having to navigate the culture slightly differently because of that kind of slight dynamic so straight away there's an advantage for me having to kind of be able to navigate that that space a bit a bit easier than others um so yeah so i, th I just think there is something about creating spaces where people can have conversations and where people can where people can pull each other up about stuff whether it's clinical stuff or something about safety or something around discrimination where they can either check in on each other or actually pull each other up and say actually that's wrong um can we have a conversation about this and i think that's for all staff not just BAME staff isn't it it's the whole team Absolutely. Um, but also going back to the point you made earlier rachel about asking who, not how are you but who are you and wanting to know about people's culture i think um i think that has to be done as a team it can't just be just asking the BAME staff about that because actually everybody is so different and everybody's cultural background is different even if like my my experience as a mixed race person will be different from another person who's mixed race like it doesn't make our culture and our upbringing won't be the same so you know things like I don't know like I remember like in the office people talking about how they celebrate Christmas um, you know what you do and actually it's really diverse depending on how you're brought up regardless of your ethnicity um, but they all you know how do you celebrate birthdays you know those kind of conversations so it's everybody sharing rather than it being just the BAME staff being sort of singled out as wanting to know about you know what kind of food do you eat at home you know kind of I don't know I'm, maybe I'm sounding quite so articulate about this. <laughs> no you're talking about inclusivity aren't you? Yeah, I think that that's what you're saying. Do you have an inclusive, an inclusive team? And if, and again, Larry, absolutely, it's organisational culture in terms of diversity and inclusion. But do you not? Because that's what you can change, can't you? This is what the people that are listening to this podcast can change: that inclusiveness within the team, then within the department, and then when that becomes a strong voice that's when if there is inherent problems at an institutional level, that's when there'll be a difference, there'll be a disconnect, won't there? So the purpose of this conversation, the purpose of this podcast is to do exactly that. Jackie? I think um, I just picking up on what, what um, just the, the prior conversation about the 
how do, how do you start to to get these things going um i think a really good way that might work for some people is um using our patients as as the the beacon as it were so it's a stealth approach i suppose but if i can imagine if i was um when i was a band six for example um i used to present articles at the journal club and mine always tended to have a bit of you know something about socioeconomic or status or something about social disadvantages that influence um the work that we were doing so that might be one way where you could start having a conversation indirectly because you're starting to bring up some of these issues that we know are out there and they impact on health um you could just start by talking maybe if people are feeling a little bit frightened of throwing you know throwing themselves into the fray that is one way I think that can work quite well because you can have some really important discussions but the the lead-in is not maybe it's not so personal absolutely Mariam yeah actually I think Jackie what you've just said there is is really powerful and actually from very recent personal experience I can I can sort of testify to that so I run a journal club in my where I currently work in the trust and within our service, and we did a we looked at a culture a paper on culture cultural kind of competency, but from an anthropological viewpoint, and it facilitated some really powerful conversation. Um, and it, I think it, you're yeah, it's a really really good kind of quite practical way in in terms of having some of those conversations and encouraging that self reflection um, amongst the team. I think. Yeah, the, that has actually come up in a conversation, a separate conversation, actually about book clubs and about because you can pick and you can you know, obviously book our films. So some people do the pick a book that also is a movie because not everyone likes to read. Um, mm. But that is that is a really great way in, isn't it? Because it brings people together with a common cause and it can open up that conversation in that non-direct way. And it can then follow on conversations can happen. So I think that's a really great example. And that may be something that people listening to this think actually that could be something really great within my organization or my team. Um, how can we start that? Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned about um, religious and non-religious ceremonies and events. And I think that is a really, really great way as well to start understanding in terms of differences we have and what we celebrate and why and understanding because it brings again it's it's a light it's on a lighter note isn't it but that can that can often lead to a more in-depth understanding um and 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 i suppose um can take things in a different in a different light and maybe expose people to their lack of diversity that they're just not aware they 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 have for sure. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. So I'm kind of wanting to try and summarise all of the conversations we've had about how to start a conversation. So the purpose of this podcast for new leaders was how to start the conversation, how how to, to have the conversation. And it's, for me, the big themes that have came out from you all is about being kind, decent human beings. And generally, as therapists, we are and generally when people are interested or want to help it's from a kind way it's it's not from a malicious way or it's not from an ignorant way but my experience my personal experience is that um people don't understand their own identity um particularly white people and for me it's about people going away and just thinking about that and it's not a criticism it doesn't mean anyone's done anything bad. They're not bad people. It's just about understanding that. And then look around your department or your team and the diversity that exists. And how much do you know? How much do you want to know? Everything that everyone said about it being kind in an inclusive way, because it's really important that we do that. And then the next thing is how we act on that. So how we acknowledge and act and the act might be trying to be bring people together in an inclusive ma manner. So not segregating people and not isolating people, but bringing people together in an inclusive manner, which we have the power to do as the new leaders of our profession. So I'm going to go around and ask everyone how they want to summarize and any points that we haven't picked up. 
um, to conclude rather than me having the final words. So Mariam, can I come to you first, please? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be said for listening, just listening. I think creating the space and just allowing people to, to, to connect with your colleagues um, um, and just listen, because chances are, if you're actually listening, you'll find out who they are and, and you'll find out how they like to be identified and you'll find out what what their you know what their perspective is on things and where they stand um and i think that we could just all do with doing a bit more of that just listen and and actually you'll find that your colleagues are telling you already yep yeah, absolutely 100 percent. safe space create that safe space to listen arnie um yeah i think Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> Just if you've got any if you've got any summary points or anything that you'd like to add, should we come to Larry and then we can come back to you, Arnie? Have a little think. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess for me it's a few things. So there's something about listening, which is obviously really important, um, as mentioned already. I think there's also something about not thinking you 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 have to have the answers. So so I guess kind of what Rachel is doing now, so you can create a space to facilitate conversations that's that can be done um i think we as i mentioned this before i think there are different levels of conversation so there are there are conversations for inquiry just either on a one-to-one -one basis or on a group basis or as a team basis actually guys this is an issue it's an elephant in the room should we have a conversation about it how are people feeling at the moment what are the experiences how is it impacting on our team do you want to have a conversation on a one-to-one -one basis so i think that that's really important um, and I, and I think there's also something around just being genuine um, in your interest because people can see through tokenism. Um, so so if you're going to ask, then you've got to be prepared to to listen fully, and where possible to act on the things that you're able to influence, um, and also be vulnerable. It's okay to not know the answer to some of these really difficult conversations. So. So there's a phrase of things called wicked problems. They're wicked for a reason. These things have existed for a really long time. You're not going to change them by yourself, but it's okay to, to be part of the solution and actually recognising that is a really important thing. Brilliant. Yes, I'm just, I'm just that absor absorbing everything you're saying, Larry. It's completely. Um, Jackie, can I come to you next? Um, yeah, I think for me, it's about, um, it's coming back to this idea of authenticity is, you know, there's the being human and, and the token stuff, because we can see through token stuff. It's not a genuine conversation if it's, if it's accompanied by, I don't know, for example, a survey about, you know, well-being and amongst the BAME community or something, you can, it doesn't feel like you want to participate in that but the more inclusive stuff around if you come and talk to me about me about my lunch I'm like I love it let's have a chat about the food we're eating so I think as long as you have that genuine curiosity and it's coming from like you said from a, from a, a safe space you have a an environment where you can do these things you know that's fine that that is probably way way more impactful than some of the other stuff that is happening on an organizational level as it should do but I think you can make a huge difference um, by doing those little small things in it if you do it authentically absolutely I, I think it's and it's the you know there's a movement isn't there what matters to me and for our patients and it's exactly the same for our peers and staff um, why it matters and, and what matters I completely agree with you Jackie that was lovely thank you and Arnie yeah I have a chance to think now thanks <laughs> um, so I think to reiterate what the others have said really about it has to be genuine and authentic and also having the kind of um, being okay with making yourself vulnerable to have those conversations but also listening but also being prepared to answer questions that staff might have for you as well so it's not just a one-way conversation but you know, to, to be prepared that you might be challenged as well on, on, on something you might have done or your behaviour. Um, and I really like the idea of using our expertise as clinicians to start having this conversation as well about patient groups 
and about the kind of um, inequalities that our patients are actually facing because that's something that binds us all together as, as, um, as healthcare workers is that we want we want our patients to get the best possible treatment and actually those inequalities really need to be called out in order for us to have some sort of meaningful change. So I don't want to mean, I don't mean to have the last word but can I just add to what Arnie said <laughs> which is these things obviously really matter for us as humans in our experiences but actually this stuff actually does harm patient care and, and, that, and that is really important and, and I think you're so right in terms of being that I guess unifying thing Sorry, can I just add something? Um, uh, so I think I think we've obviously spoken a lot about how our colleagues can support us um, today. I think one final thing that I'd really, really like to say is I think for all black people and um, people of colour within healthcare, allied health, I think it's really, really valuable that we acknowledge our own position as agents of change um, and as leaders because whilst we work towards a, a, a better society where you know there's going to be equality and all our managers are going to be treating us fairly and there's going to be an equitable system that still remains very much an idea for, for the majority of black people and people of color so i think it's really we do need to be able to have the capacity and the space to acknowledge our own leadership um, and acknowledge that we we can create that change and we can work towards it as well in whatever capacity we do have access to and we aren't kind of at the mercy of other people creating this change within our professions and um, we are agents of change and as you know Arnie and um, has already said really beautifully is that actually at the end of the day it affects people we work with and that's got to be at the heart of what we do. And that, Mariam, is one of the reasons why you're doing this on a Sunday evening, because you guys are inspirational role models. And one of the things we really need to champion is inspirational role models that look like us and people can identify. And that is why I'm so grateful you've took the time today to spend talking to me. And, you know, we've touched on patients at the very end there now. That was a deliberate thing because that could be a whole podcast in itself. And I think if people do genuinely feel the need um, help in how we reach out to our BAME patients because of the differences that exist, then that is something that we can definitely facilitate and we can bring a panel together. But for now, our main aim of doing this, we are not experts in this. I am not an expert in this. I'm learning. These guys here are not experts. I've reached out to them and said, I need help. And they've done that and they've put themselves forward and been brave to have the conversation that is difficult and challenging on so many levels. Um, so thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks.